Okay, so the Bible. Well, all glory to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible, the truth. Yeah, which which Bible version? Which Bible version should you read? And it's complicated. It's a complicated question. The simple version is the King James. If you need an answer, if you're looking for, if you just want to cut through the crap and you need a Bible version to read, the King James, the short explanation would be, I think I might have been covering out the microphone, the King James Bible. The short version of the explanation would be because it's been around for 400 years, it's been well studied, it's well known, uh, it's not perfect, but you need, you need to rely, you need a version of God's word and it's out of the versions that are available to you, it is trustworthy. You know, it's, it's high on the list. It's not perfect, but you know, I'll talk about that more in this video. So, when I was starting on my journey with God, with Jesus, I had a King James Bible, and I read Matthew and well, read the read the Gospels and. I didn't read all of the New Testament, and then I read Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, and then I, I was finding it a little bit tricky. So I, I got a New King James Bible, because I thought maybe that would be easier. And I did find that easier to read, and I read the rest of the Bible with the New King James. But I was just worried about the, you know, the versions you know, because the the versions are different. I had a, a New American Standard Bible as well. I read a little bit of that. Um, my wife has an NIV, so I read a little bit of the NIV, and I really didn't like the NIV. But yeah, I just couldn't... I was just uncertain about which version to use, and I got an ESV as well, and I read a bit of the ES, ESV. And I didn't, didn't really like the ES, ESV that much. And so I decided, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to do a comparative analysis. I'm going to go through and I'm going to go verse by verse and go through a bunch of different Bibles and I'm going to look at, you know, what, what they all say and I'm going to write out my version. I'm going to start at Genesis and just write out my version of the Bible. In fact, I'm going to go get you what I wrote. Hold on a second. Okay, well, the light is bad. All right, just to, to show you. I have to turn the camera around. All right, just to show you what I did, basically I did a comparative analysis of the different um, different Bibles. I had a bunch of different Bibles. I might put a picture up. I take a picture and put it up. And I was just going through, and initially I was like, all right, I'm just going to look at all the verses and try to figure out which is the best verse <laughs> from each of the Bibles. Which, which, you know, looking at the original. Hebrew as well, like using a Strong's Concordance and using the Blue Letter Bible and really going through and just trying to figure out what's the, what does each verse say and then write out the, the best version of each verse. And as you can see, there's different, um, different colors and things. So if, if I couldn't figure out the best word or if there was some contention, I'd just write multiple words. I also went through and I put some notes in. You can see there's like some notes at the bottom of the page. Uh, for various things, and sometimes, like up here, you can't see it. <laughs> you can see there's different colors, but I basically just went through, and sometimes I couldn't figure out what the what the verse was saying, so I put multiple versions in, and I went through and I put all the meanings of all the names when I had a couple of different sources for them, so I went through, and I went through the pretty much all of Genesis. I got to chapter 48, and then I sort of realized it was not the best use of my time. But yeah, I went through and I really <laughs> tried to figure out which is the best version of the Bible. And I basically moved towards the King James as I went along. I, I looked at probably 14 or 15 different Bible versions. And I was finding that over time I was moving away from... I was just moving towards the King James. So there are certain Bible versions like the American Standard Version and the Derby Translation and Young's Literal Translation... And the Geneva Bible, 1599 Geneva Bible, which are the ones that are closest to the King James. I was moving more towards them, away from the American Standard and the New American Standard. Um, and 
So, no, so, yeah, sorry, the, moving away from the New American Standard and the ESV and uh, those types, the newer types. I'm just going to turn the camera around. Yeah, so I, was, I moved away from the newer, newer versions. I just found that the, the King James just it was the, the best. It just seemed the best. It somehow it was being drawn to that one. And uh, like there are some problems with it, though. So I'm going to talk about some problems with the King James because I think a lot of people will, will... There's a lot of debate as to which is the best Bible version. And I think most of the arguments are bad arguments. Like the, the, real, the only real argument for the King James, I think, is that it's a reliable standard. It's not, it's not the best... Like it's not a perfect version. It's not literal. Like it doesn't literally translate the, the Hebrew. And even if it did, like which Hebrew version are you going to go on? And... Yeah, there are some issues, so I'll go into some of those issues, but the the debate seems to stem, you know, is, is it just King James, King James only? Is that the only version, or can you use any version? Uh, we certainly can't use any version, because some versions are quite obviously satanic perversions. I mean, like the, like the Message, or like the Mirror. I think, it's, I think it's called the Mirror. And the NIV, I would say, is a perversion. It's not God's Word. It's... At best, to, to, to be nice to the people who wrote it, it's, a, uh, it's an interpretation of God's Word by the people who did the t interpretation. It's not, it's, not, it's not God's Word. <laughs> and then you get the, the, uh, the ESV and the NASB are decent. I, I think the ESV is probably better than the, the North American Standard. Although the, the new version of the North American Standard is good in that there are a lot of Footnotes which have the literal meanings because a, a lot of the like in the Hebrew there are a lot of expressions that aren't translated into English. But the North Amer the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, the new versions of that have a lot of footnotes which give you the literal meanings, which is interesting. I find it interesting. Um, but overall, I think the ESV is probably more readable. But it, the rule. The problem is just, it just comes down to the, the things that you don't notice unless you look closely. Like, there were just things that are changed, things that are changed. Like, I don't want to do a deep uh, explanation video here, but the, every, every version has their own, their own quirks, and some of them matter, some of them don't. Like, for example, at the beginning of sentences, the King James will say and a lot. Like, it'll start off a lot of sentences sentences with and uh, whereas the ESV will normally just get rid of the and and just start off with whatever the next word is and then the new King James will use like then or so or you know some other word and they all have like so that'll be one example of a difference and that that particular difference probably doesn't matter and then there are other differences like just interpret degrees of interpretation let's say so the new versions will aim to make things easier to understand for a modern audience, but you don't really want things to be easier to understand for a modern audience if that means changing a word that that means something, you know. Like this, I don't know, it's it's a big conversation, uh, yeah, big topic. But no, you can't read any version of the Bible. There are differences between them, and if there are differences between them, that necessarily means that some are better than others. And there are some some that are definitely bad, and so it's it's not simple from that perspective. But the King James it has issues too. It, some I don't think it's that hard to read when you get into it. It is initially because the the language is from you know, 1611, so it's old language. But you do get used to it. But it's not a literal translation in that it doesn't directly translate the the Hebrew or the Greek. And it has other issues as well, but what, what you really need in a Bible version is just a reliable standard. And the King James, if you, if you need to pick a version, it's a good version to have. And so that's what you should be reading, in my opinion, after that, I've done that study of Genesis. I have to say that the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are different in the, uh, the quality of the translation. I think when you read in the Old Testament, it probably doesn't matter as much which version you read. But the New Testament, it definitely does. There are a lot of a lot of differences between the versions, and so 
Yeah, I think the King James is probably the best version. But be careful because like, there, is, there are people who base their entire ide- ideology and their entire life basically on the King James Bible, which I think is dangerous because you know, the, the King James Bible exists within a context. And that context is the world, <laughs> the world in which we live. And you need to look at the world and you need to look at history and you need to look at what other people think. And, you know, there's a, there's a context and you can't just read the Bible and know the truth. The, the Bible is an extraordinarily useful tool to know the truth because if something contradicts the Bible, then you go with the Bible. And the Bible is right. The Bible has proved, for me, the Bible has proved to be right 100% of the time. And it has been an extraordinary tool to lead me towards truth and understanding. But you can't just read it. You've got to, you've got to read, read the Bible and interact with the world, and you've got to test your knowledge against the things that you're seeing. Uh, yeah, so that's, it's a danger to get too deeply into the Bible. Not so much do, getting too deeply into the Bible, but being a Bible-only person. You've got to be a Bible, and also you go outside sometimes, which, I mean, I should take my own advice. But... Yeah, you need, to, you need to interact with the world as well, sort of, and have a balance between those things. Um, but yeah, the Bible, a very useful tool, the most useful tool, I'd say, that and praying. And you know, if you've got the Holy Spirit, um, you can ask Jesus and ask God for help, and you'll be led to the truth. And the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And has, that has proved to be true. And it helps you to discern the truth from lies. And you have to humble yourself. That's another important, uh, very important actually, humility. Humility is important because you don't know the truth. And this is one of the errors I see a lot of people make is that they, they'll figure something out that other people don't know and they'll therefore think that they know the truth, but they don't. Nobody knows the truth ultimately. When you really break down what's going on in the world, you know, when you ask the question, how do you know that? And you keep asking that question, like, how do you know that? How do you know that for sure? You can keep asking that question until you get to the point where you don't know anything. It really comes down to what do you have, what do you have faith in? Do you have faith that the scientists are telling you the truth? I mean, are the scientists who are telling you about reality being honest. Are they being honest, but they're wrong? You know, are, they, are they wrong because their experiments were wrong, or they, you know, they, they collected their data incorrectly, or did they test for the wrong thing, or you know, did the peer review happen correctly, or was there deliberate deceit there? And what was the deliberate deceit? Is it, is it that they're evil, or is it just that their livelihood is based on a positive result in this experiment that they've devoted the last five years of their life to setting up and, and the last 20 years of their life is built up to doing the experiment and so therefore you know, it's important to them and it's important to their team and it's important to, you know, all the... What, do you trust them and why do you trust them? And have you checked? Have you checked the results? Can you check the results? Because there are a lot of things you can't check. You need to be careful about that about trusting things that you can't actually check. Ideally, you would check everything. You know, you find something out about reality, some fact or something, something that is claimed to be a fact. Ideally, you'd check that if it's important. A lot of the time, you can't. I'd say most of the time, you can't. When you really get down to it, really get down to what is the truth? <laughs> How do you know that that's the truth? How do you know that that's... What, what are you basing your, your truth on? Well... The Bible is very useful because the Bible tells you. The Bible is the inspired word of God. I don't think that, I, mean, I do think that based on faith, but it's not a blind faith. I think this is something that Christians get wrong, or religious people, as they get wrong a lot, is that, yes, you do need faith, but it doesn't need to be a completely blind faith. You can check, you can check up, you can check up on God. I, I don't think God minds. Uh, you checking up on him, like just you know, he says something. I don't think he expects you to just take it as true without checking. I think he expects you to look into it. You're supposed to test all things to see if they be true. So if you've got 
don't have blind faith. Blind faith is what turns you into a zealot. It turns you into an unthinking... Well, all of the bad things about religion, that's, that's what you become when you have blind faith. You don't have blind faith. You have faith. You trust. You trust God. You trust Jesus. Jesus. But you, you check. If there's something that's bothering you and you want to know the answer, you, you can find out the answer. Jesus will tell you. Some, some things you can't. The, the thing... The divide between what you can know and what you can't sort of comes to... It's between the material and the spiritual world. We can't really know a lot about the spiritual world, I don't think, because we can't interact with it in a very meaningful way. I mean, we have... If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and so you've got some link to the spiritual world. But we don't know what heaven's like. Nobody, nobody's been to heaven. Or well, I mean, but we haven't... I haven't been to heaven. I can't check what's up there. You know, I have dreams, and there are spiritual dreams, but they don't mean a lot when I'm awake. And, you know, there's this information in the Bible, but really, when it comes to spiritual things, it's, there's an entire world there that we don't understand. You know, what, what are angels exactly? What, what is God's way? I don't know. I mean, I mean, as far as what has God told us to do while we're on this earth, yeah, we can know that. How does you know who is God actually, and how does He actually work? You know the Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost and angels and how how does that all actually work? What are the mechanics of it? Well, I don't think we can know that while we're here. So there is there are there are some things we need to have faith on. We're not going to get all of the answers, but you can find out a lot of things. So yeah, the Bible it's a it's a good book to to base your truth on, and I highly recommend, even if you aren't a religious person, it's a good book to read because it is a, it's the most read book in history. It inspired, one way or another, such a large percentage of what's, what's going on in our culture. If you don't know it, you don't know the basis of our culture. And what I mean is, like, not just our beliefs, but also, you know, our, our literature... Uh, movies and music and our culture, everything. A lot of it is based on the Bible. And if you want some interesting stuff to read, well, the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, and the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, and the last book of the New Testament. Even if you aren't religious, even if you don't believe, I highly recommend those books. Uh, Genesis you know, starts off with creation and then the Garden of Eden, and then you know Cain and Abel, you know, first children of Adam and Eve, and Cain killing Abel, and then goes into the the angels coming down from heaven and mating, <laughs> having having it off with uh, the women, and creating the the Nephilim, and things going really badly, and the flood, and you know, all, all life, you know, that, that story and then the Tower of Babel and that's, you know, the first 11 chapters or so and then, you know, there's 50 chapters in the book and it goes into so many things that you would have heard of in your secular life but, you know, read the story, it's not that long, it's not that long of a book, it's highly recommend it and then Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, is very interesting, I keep saying that word a lot, it goes into all sorts of things. Jesus, you know, gets born in the beginning. So the genealogy of Jesus, and he gets born, and you know, it's got that story. And then, you know, Herod, the the king at the time, kills a lot of the all, all of the males under the age of two, trying to get to Jesus because he doesn't want Jesus to overthrow him. And so, um, you know, Joseph and Mary and Jesus go to Egypt, and then so there's that story, and then. Got Jesus grown up a little bit, and he does the forty days fast in the desert, and then Satan tempts him, and there's that interaction, and then there's the Sermon on the Mount, and that's all that happens in the first seven chapters. So it's it's not a lot you have to read to encounter a lot of a lot of things that you would have heard of, and then Matthew as a whole isn't a particularly long book, and it goes into the miracles and things like that, and then the Book of Revelation it's about the period of time which is going to come up very soon, I think. And it's a, you won't understand it when you when you read it the first time. I don't understand it. I've read it a number of times, but it's a there are certain truths. There are certain truths that although you can't know the answer to, like the the true nature of God, 
and you know prophecy. You can't you can't know prophecy is true until it happens, and uh, like the nature of evil, you know, and why does God allow evil, and things like that. There are certain things that you can't know the answers to. You can't know the ultimate answer, I should say. You know, what's what's it going to be like when Jesus is ruling the earth for a thousand years, or what's what's the new heaven and earth going to look like? Or, we don't know. We, there's no way we can know. We can think about those things. And by thinking about those things, I call them sort of pulley truths. Like they, they pull you towards the truth. You, you can't necessarily get to the end point, but by thinking about them, it, it's, a, it's a good intellectual exercise to think about these things. And then you read the Bible, and you, know, you think about the things in the Bible, and there are a lot of good moral lessons in there. It's essentially, as I understand it, it's sort of the history of God's family. And <laughs> all of the things that his children have done very badly, all of the mistakes, and as an example, I think, so that in the future we can look back and say, oh, the, the, you know, every time we think about doing something that's wrong, we can look at the Bible and say, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, somebody did that in the past and there's a record of it and we know how it turned out. That's what I think is going on with the, this phase of the plan, I guess. It's an, it's an example. So it's, it's interesting to look at from, history, from a historical perspective, it's good because it's the inspired word of God. I mean, if you want a deep book, it's the deepest book. It's a pretty cool book. I mean, the, you read it once and you'll you won't you know you'll get you get some of it, but you'll know that you're missing a lot. You read it a second time and you know you do your research into it and you find out different things and it opens up your understanding. It's quite an amazing book. So I highly recommend it, even if you aren't a religious person. Uh, at least read. Read Genesis and Exodus, and you know if, if you aren't a Christian, I mean it's. I'm gonna. I'll talk more in in the future videos, I guess, about. Or maybe I'll talk a bit in this one about what's coming. But you, you'll know you'll know that it's real soon enough. But. Yeah, maybe I'll, but yeah. So Genesis, Exodus, interesting stories. You will have heard a lot about them. Exodus is about uh, Moses and the people in Egypt, uh, the Israelites in Egypt and how they, they leave Egypt. And you would have heard a lot into the burning bush and a lot of the things you would have heard. The play, Ten plagues, plagues of Egypt is in that book. So it's good. And then what else? Yeah, the books of the New Testament. The book of John is good. Another good place to start. In the beginning, of, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's a pretty cool book as well and then Isaiah is a pretty cool book it's a, it's a prophecy book if you want to read prophecy the revelation revelation is one but uh, Isaiah is another good one if you look if you want to get into the bible I don't know if it's the best place to start but yeah that's good too what else am I going to say yeah so what's coming up so the book of revelation and the book of Daniel and uh, a, lot, a lot of the books actually a lot of the prophetic books talk about the period of time that's coming up but basically, as I understand it, we're getting to the point in time where so many people have abandoned God, they've abandoned the path, they've abandoned Jesus, they've you know, they've gone the wrong way, that God is just about to, well, in the last period, I'd say, because I don't know when it's going to happen, you know, no man knows the day or hour, but no one knows when it's going to happen, but when it happens, when this, this end period happens, the time of Jacob's trouble, so the last seven years, I guess, this is when God's pouring out his wrath on the earth. He's, uh, he's angry because people have abandoned him. And, but so he's going to pull, out, pull these people out of the earth in the, the rapture. All of the people who are in Jesus are going to leave. And everybody who's left is going to have to deal with... I suppose, in a, in a sense, you could say it's what they're asking for, and that Satan is going to rule the earth. Or Satan or his son, Apollyon the Destroyer, is the angel of the bottomless pit is in the book of Revelation. I can't remember which chapter it is. Probably should have looked that up, but you can find it. Uh, it's, it's the bit that talks about the angel of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, or in, in his Greek. In Greek, his name is Apollyon. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon. So he'll be ruling, you know, Apollo of the, uh, the Greek pantheon. Is it Greek or Roman? One of them. Anyway, Apollo. He's going to be ruling the earth. 
And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next video, I think, because there's technological things that are happening as well. I haven't talked about artificial intelligence yet. And yeah, so I might sign off here because it's nearly 20 minutes. So I'll get back to you. Oh, praise be to Jesus.